I, I thought if I just stood up here that everyone would like <laughs> stop talking, but you know, that's partially what this is all about. So I appreciate the, the conversation. So I finally got my swim in this morning, and tomorrow we're going to have a group baptism in front of the College of the Atlantic, which would be wonderful. But it did occur to me when I was doing that swim that, you know, there's this term grounded, that, uh, oh, you need to be better grounded, right? And um, um, I think that we need, we're, we need to be better watered is the new idea. So as we, if one thing comes out of this, we need to be better watered human beings. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to, to welcome everyone and just say how grateful I am to David and Susan Rockefeller for helping make this connection between the College of the Atlantic and Oceana. And I'm super excited to have this crew of people here. Um, I think a lot of the work that we've seen so far, it comes from amazing individuals. It also comes from amazing institutions. And in terms of the oceans and ocean health and the future, it's hard to think about others that have done more work than, than Oceana. So thank you very much. Um, and as any great conversation, it starts with a great interlocutor. And we've got a great one today. And so Francis Sellers has been with us for so long uh, helping articulate these, these great programs. So thank you, Francis, for doing this. And welcome, and let's start the show. So welcome. Thank you very much, Darren. And welcome, everybody, um, on another beautiful morning here in Maine. Um, I'm just delighted to be al able to welcome two great experts on this key topic, which is turning the tide on plastics. Both come from Oceana, which is the largest conservation organization dedicated to protecting the oceans. So I'm going to keep the introductions short because in your books you will find much more about their biographies. But to my left is Jackie Savitz. She's the uh, North America's Chief Program Officer, Policy Officer for Oceana. Um, she's an expert on microbiology and toxicology, which we're going to get into. She's worked from Belize up through North America. She's been involved in all sorts of programs through Oceana, such as treating wastewater from cruise ships, um, stopping offshore drilling and other key issues. And then over here is Andy uh, Sharpless, and uh, he has been the CEO of Oceana since 2003. And during that time, there's been enormous growth at the organization, which I think started in 2001, right, Andy? Um, so let me just give you some numbers. They now protect 4 million square miles of habitat, which is pretty extraordinary, and have been involved in 250 policy victories. And this is world over, Belize, Brazil, US, UK. Oceana's been working on these issues. Um, they're both also co-founders of the Global Fishing Watch, which we, I hope we'll be able to talk to a little bit later on. It's an online platform. Google and Skywatch are involved, and I've had a quick look through uh, globalfishingwatch.org, which is very interesting because it's a data-driven, uh, very transparent uh, insight into how people are interacting with the oceans around the world, so it's worth looking into that. And just one more thing about Andy before we go, go on. Um, the, the stage over there is named after one Lucy Bell Sellers, um, who was the drama teacher here for 25 years and actually cut her teeth, I think, teaching Andy drama <laughs> <laughs> as a ninth grader. Um, she also, in this audience, as you say, she also happens to be my mother-in-law. So, <laughs> so it's, it's a small family here. Anyway, when, um, when I was asked to moderate this, um, I thought, gosh, this is just a topic that everybody cares about and knows about. Great topic, right? And then I had the flip side of that, which is it's just so big and intractable, and how the heck do we get anywhere? And I sometimes moderate climate conferences, and you have the same sort of huge stress about how do you engage people, what are the next steps, and how do you stop people from throwing their hands up in the air? So I wanted to start with two very broad questions. Jackie, perhaps you can just give us the lay of the land. Plastics, what are we dealing with with plastics in the ocean? What's the scope of this problem? Sure, thanks Francis, and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, you know, plastics are in our environment in a way that is affecting marine animals, it's affecting human health, it's affecting climate change, it's related to climate change, and when I first thought of it, I always thought of it, well, there's some plastics around. Not such a big deal. But when we started looking into it, we realized this is a massive crisis that we're dealing with with plastics. We're talking about 33 billion pounds of plastics getting into our oceans globally every year, 
And just to put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of two dump truck loads of plastics getting into the oceans every minute. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're going to be here for, what, about an hour. So you right. can imagine that's a lot of dump trucks that are around the world, but it adds up, okay? And so we know that that's a problem. And if that wasn't bad enough, we also know that this number is expected to triple or even quadruple by 2050. Because we're looking at, essentially, we're looking at the next big petroleum peak, right? If we're not going to be using as much petroleum in our cars, what are they going to use it for? Well, they want to figure out how to sell more, and they're going to do that through plastics. And that's why we're seeing these proposals for massive new plastics factories all around the country. Um, and that's, that gives you a sense of the magnitude of the problem. Um, and you can start thinking about what does that mean for marine life? What does it mean for human health? What does it mean for climate change? What, what, just to follow up quickly on that, are we talking about big chunks of plastic when you talk about those dump trucks or microplastic and will be, you know, furniture or the right. stuff that comes off our fleece when we wash it? Some of both. Yeah. Um, and you're getting to a very interesting thing about plastics, which is they don't break down. They don't degrade in the environment. All they do is break up into smaller and smaller pieces. And that's where we get some of the microplastics that are out there. And we're talking about plastics that are like a millimeter in length. And so no way you're going to clean that up. It's out there, it's out there. It's not going anywhere. And this is plastics that's available to marine animals and they can consume it. Um, we're finding the plastic in sea turtle bellies, we're finding it in fish, they're finding it in drinking water, and it gets, starts getting to a human perspective, they're starting to find it in us too. Um, and the amount of microplastics that's out there is, is extreme. And it's not going anywhere. So the trick is not to let it get in the environment in the first place. And that's we'll where we to focus. That yeah. In a minute. But first, Andy, you go around the world with these incredible projects and you visit people who've got many different strategies for tackling this problem. And we're going to talk specifically about Oceanus. But give me an overview. You know, how, what are people doing and what models do you see in various parts of the world? So you're right, I do get a global perspective on this thanks to the Oceana uh, teams that are working on this, but also just the, the, the interest in this issue that is mm. really high. I mean, if you're trying to do ocean conservation, you often have to start talking to people about something they don't understand and draw them in. That's not true about ocean plastic. Right. And so, right. There is a big struggle on the, in the world over how to frame the problem. And to start at a very simple level, many people have been taught that the problem is a downstream problem and that the thing we have to do is to be better managers of our own waste and that our personal waste practices and our town's waste practices and our city's waste practices are the answer. That's one framing of the problem. There's another framing of the problem which is an upstream framing of the problem that the decision by companies chiefly to use a material that lasts forever for a single-use purpose has a predictable consequence for the world and it's called pollution and so oversimplifying because there are people in the middle between those two extremes a little bit but not a lot you have to decide how you want to frame the problem in order to get the solution right and we hope that if we do one thing here today in this conversation is to convince all of you that the only way to solve this problem is to frame it as a pollution problem, as an upstream solution, and to hold the people who are making that decision responsible for being more, more accountable and more responsible. Jackie Savitz is the first person who used the metaphor that I hope you will leave here, so I'm giving you credit, Jackie. Go ahead. Steal it from Jackie. If you were, if you were confronted with an overflowing bathtub, God forbid, and you had to solve that problem as it's overflowing, and you were the sensible person that I know all of you to be, <laughs> would you run to get a good mop or would you turn off the faucet? <laughs> Which would you do first? I'm the plastic industry faucet. is telling us there's some really good mops. Folks, if only you would go get better mops, this problem of plastic pollution can be handled. So go get better mops, you dummies. That's what, <laughs> that's what their message is. We need to tell them, no. 
the responsible thing is to turn off the faucet of elastic pollution. So that's the metaphor that makes sense to us. It makes sense. And by the way, one fact, and then I'll stop. How much pollution has been recycled? How much plastic has been recycled in the entire history of this industry? Most of us, including me, are old enough to remember a world that was not filled with single-use plastics. So in the sh relatively short history, life history of plastic in, in the world, how much plastic has been recycled to date? The number is 9%, but actually it's 2% when you think about actual recycling. The, the gentleman knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yes. oh, Just that. so everybody gets it, the answer is 9%, generously stated, but only 2% when you analyze it more carefully. Okay, I want to challenge you a little bit about this because I asked you about what was going on around the world and yesterday when I was preparing, I opened my Twitter feed and what did I see right, just by chance, right at the top of the Twitter feed was um, a tweet from the Ocean Cleanup, which is a Dutch-based organization saying, and I got the numbers, more than 100,000 kilograms of plastics had been removed from this great plastic swamp in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, somewhere between California and Hawaii, and that represented one one thousandth of the plastic they are collecting out there. So there are these models. What's, and that is neither recycling as we do it domestically, and it's also not stopping it at the source. What about things like that, and how do you see them being operated? That's a famous one, but elsewhere around the world. Yeah, so I'm, I am personally very troubled by the people who are, call, who are proposing the ultimate downstream focus here, which is not even what I was talking about a moment ago, which is that your town needs to have a good recycling system. This is, after it's in the ocean, let's figure out a way to get it out of the ocean. This is like, even from the downstream that I was talking about a moment ago. This is not only, I mean, these people have good intentions, but they are affirmatively hurting the future here because they are, they are unintentionally, I believe, validating in the worst possible way the downstream framing of the, of the problem. Think, pause and think for a second about this. Are we going to get the oceans sieved in some way? Are we going to take, I mean, there's microplastics, as Jackie was saying. What are we going to do? Filter the ocean through some really precise sieve and get the plastic out of there? And by the way, if you did that, would there be any oh, I don't know, fish left <laughs> in the ocean. Also, the, the ocean cleanup people tend to focus on cleaning up surface ocean floating plastic, like you say, the famous plastic island in the gyre in the Pacific. Don't forget that there's plastic throughout the, sea co the water column. There's also huge, huge amounts of plastic on the seafloor. Oceana has done a bunch of expeditions where we send ROVs to the seafloor to photograph what's down there. And there's a lot of plastic just deposed on the seafloor. So this is, a, this is a so profoundly misguided conversation. And there's some very wealthy philanthropists who have backed some very charismatic people to do something that's not going to work. It's not, it's not going to work. I mean, if, I mean, a friend of mine, and I don't want to go on talking. You know, a friend of mine says, if you like doing ocean, you know, plastic cleanups, like you like walking around on a beach and cleaning up plastic have I got good news for you because <laughs> you can do it for the rest of eternity <laughs> it's not it's not going to stop we're not going to solve the problem at that end of it and like you know if you think Sisyphus you know needs to be brought back to work to life here you know th we have a way to do that so Jackie Andy credited you with this wonderful bathtub metaphor. <laughs> but you're, you're very much a data-driven person, and I'd love to just understand a little bit of how you reach that conclusion and what sort of science goes into understanding this reframing before we get to the challenges of reframing this debate. Well, I think, you know, I can't say that I arrived at the analogy based on data, but more, more just the, what I think is an obvious concept, which mm -hmm. is if we're continually increasing the amount of this stuff we're producing. I mean, think about it. We didn't even have plastic in parts of many of our lives. When I was a kid, plastics wasn't a thing, you know? And then it became a thing, and then it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the fa the, just the m massive growth rate of plastics and the projection that it's going to quadruple by 2050 makes it clear that we can't, we can't mop it up. 
we can't mop it up if mopping it up means recycling. That's only less than 9% effective. We can't mop it up if it means dragging booms around the oceans, you know, to try to collect it after it's already in there. Um, and so we have to turn off the faucet. And source reduction is the term that a lot of environmentalists use, which is you have to solve the problem at the source. And this was the solution when we were talking about um, persistent toxic chemicals like PCBs, when mm. we talk about mercury. We don't talk about let's go out and clean up the mercury out of the environment. We say let's stop putting mercury in the environment. Because once it's out there, you lose control of it. You know, entropy takes over and you're not really going to be able to collect it. So if we could stop producing this stuff, especially for purposes that are single use, as Andy said, the greatest design flaw of using something that's made to last forever for something you're going to use once and throw away in, in minutes or seconds. Um, and and if, we, if we can't stop the growth of that, let alone actually start reducing it, there's just no way we're going to clean it up. And in no countries, I mean, is, is there no technological future where there'd be some kind of plastic magnet or something? I don't know. Would so, I mean, uh, do, you, do you see, uh, just technology is moving so fast in so many areas. Do you see any advances there that no. could solve? None. <laughs> None. Not in, now, hang on. Australia's no, working I, I mean with nanotechnology. I mean, no, the short answer is no, and Jackie will give the longer answer. Not give the answer. Like, stop. Give the longer answer yeah. just quickly so we understand that. Because yeah. well, I, mean, I think the things you hear about are, you know, this, this new microbe has been discovered right, that's going to eat plastic. the plastics, and it's like, it's, you know, in, you know, some small amount of um, plastic can be consumed by this microbe that would have to be like massively scaled. Um, they really just, they're, they're hopeful and they're just really not practical. And it's not like the solution is so hard. It's not like it means we have to stop living. It simply means we have to start thinking a little more carefully about things like packaging, about things like, you know, eating utensils in restaurants and takeaway. And it's not rocket science. I mean, people are already seeing um, alternatives to plastics when they go to restaurants. We're already seeing states saying no more styrofoam. And we're, and we're surviving that. Right. So do I need to Made bet on the microbe? <laughs> do we want to bet on the microbe or do we want to bet on source reduction as a solution? Can I just, so, and can yeah, I, can I, I absolutely want to add good. one. So one really important thing to understand, and it's counterintuitive, is that as plastic breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller particles, ultimately, you know, microscopic, it's still plastic. It doesn't break down into its component constituents and then that are then accessible to nature and useful by nature. It remains plastic. So it just, when we say this is a material that is just essentially lasts forever, it doesn't last forever in familiar forms, but it's there. I mean, the people have talked about how how um, in some future archaeological dig, they will be built, able to identify this moment in the planet's history because there will be this thin layer of plastic, you know, evident in the in the in the in the dig, um, like you know, like there is from the the impact of the asteroid. You know what I mean? Uh, Eighty some million year, you know years ago. So. You have to confront that thing about the material. Second point is, when, when, and this is relevant advice to any technical fix conversation you are ever invited into. And I used to, before I was, I, in my career, I had I, space as a public interest advocate and then as a business person and then again as a public interest advocate. And in, in the business question needs to be asked about anybody who brings you a technical fix, which is, okay, you made that work in a laboratory. Great. What's the cost? Can we scale this up globally at any price anybody would ever pay? And you, you will all, as optimistic and hopeful people and curious people, and many of you are intellectually curious, get entranced by technical fixed conversations because the technology can be interesting and promising. But you just have to remember that business question. Okay, so what's it cost? Mm -hmm. And is it scalable? And, um, and, and so that problem, that question, will usually pretty much end the technical fix right. conversation right. that people might invite you into on a lot of topics, but also on plastic. So I'd love, my next question is to you both, and you can decide who goes first, but the challenges to reframing this problem as a pollution problem, 
how, what are you seeing? You're very much a policy person. You're out there leading this global organization. Maybe, Jackie, you want to talk first from a policy perspective. What challenges do you see as you try to address not open, willing audiences like this, but other people in legislatures across the country or in, when we get to you and in other forums? Well, I think, Francis, I think the biggest challenge we face is the counter um, narrative which is coming out very strongly from the petroleum and uh, petrochemical industry and the plastics industry and the food packaging industry. They're all kind of teamed up on this. It wasn't bad enough to just have one. Mm -hmm. We have all of, these, all of these massive industries and all of their resources framing a counter narrative that this is a solvable problem, recycling will solve it, um, you, it's your fault, consumers, it's all your fault. Um, and it's really hard to fight that at a policy level when you're dealing with legislators that want to make policies, and yet they're hearing from, in some cases, their donors, you know, that they shouldn't go in that direction, that the, the plastic industry has it under control. And all it takes for the CEO of Coke to say, I'll do X by 2050, and everybody's off their case, and everyone's like, okay, the, the solution is here. And it's like, we don't know if they're really going to do that. There's no timeline. There's no proof that they're actually doing it. And, and we can't relax when we hear things like that. And so that, I think, is really what makes it so hard to get policy change, although we're, we're chipping away at it. We'll talk about some specific mm -hmm. um, legislative changes in a moment. But tell me about framing this problem as you go out as the CEO of this massive organization. And this is one of your key issues right now. Yeah, I mean, at a high level, Francis, it's a very interesting question. Um, we're at a funny moment in, in American history and also in world history where the democracy is weak enough that people's identities as citizens have been diminished and their identity as a consumer has been elevated. And so people believe instinctively that every problem can be solved by a buying choice and that their choice as an individual consumer is the most morally significant thing they can do. And they have forgotten that, no, actually, that's good. Be a morally responsible consumer. But there's a higher level identity we each carry around with us, which is our identity as citizens of, if we're lucky, a democracy that still makes policy in response to its people. And that is the identity, that is, yes, thank you. And so Francis's question forces us to remind, you know, to face that problem over and over again and to remind people that they are citizens and that they're, they have an opportunity and a duty to get their country, whatever it is, to do the right thing for the future, which in this case means passing laws to to, to force source reduction in the, in the pollution called single-use plastic. We're going to come to some success stories about that that will make you believe it, that it actually works. Um, but, there is a, that, but that is the fundamental problem that, that we, we face, to answer your question, Francis, in trying to get people where we need them to go. So let's talk a little bit about Maine and one of these problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully, <laughs> applause there. Um, <coughs> Coincidentally, last year I was up here, there was no recycling on this island and the, legis the main legislature was um, working on EPR, which is Extended Producer Responsibility for Packaging, a bill that passed last year. Um, I think 40% of, of plastics come from, pa is that right. right? That's right. Tell me how, one and Maine is the first state to pass that uh, bill. It was fascinating reporting for me to do. Um, tell me. What, what kind of leadership that can mean for other states to follow, or, or how important a bill like that passing in a single state is. And you should probably yeah, explain a little bit more about extended producer sure. responsibility. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so this idea of EPR, or extended producer responsibility, is kind of in the right direction because it's saying we want to put this problem back on the producers. We want the producers who have all the power in this conversation, by the way, to solve this problem. Um, and you know, there are various ways you can have producers do that. You can have them put money on the table so that maybe it helps pay for your waste disposal or your recycling facility, which I believe is one of the things Part that happened that, yeah. in Maine. Um, you can also um, have them do collection. You can have them um, 
or my favorite, have them actually reduce the amount that they're producing, which mm -hmm. is also their you know extended responsibility. And Let's I guess produce less. if they're having to pay at the, the far end, they're, they're, the incentive is to produce less right. plastic or hard to recyclable. Absolutely. Materials. So so that's. So that's sort of the idea with extended producer responsibility. And Maine was the leader in getting this, this bill and this, this law through, I think it was about two years ago now. Is it two years? Um, and that's great. And you've started to see other states follow suit. Oregon has passed an EPR bill as well. Um, and I think what we like to see is sort of an increasing intensity of producer responsibility. And one of the things that a lot of conservationists criticize about EPR is you're basically, in many cases, you're, you're putting too much of the control into the producer's hands where you're saying, well, if you promise to spend a certain amount of money, that's great, and then they get to decide how to do that. That doesn't really make environmentalists very happy because they don't really tend to trust packaging producers. Um, now, uh, so we had Maine, we had mm -hmm. Oregon, now we have California, which mm -hmm. is can I go to California yes, now? Yes, that's what I would um, like Let's you go to, to do. California, even though this is so Jump nice coast. here. Um, <laughs> They just passed, I think, what is the best um, plastics reductions policy in the United States, um, which includes extended producer responsibility. The producers have to put in $5 billion over 10 years. These are all the packaging producers. They form essentially a coalition of producers, and they decide how to charge each other, who has to pay the most, depending on how much packaging they make. But the key to this one is they also put in a source reduction component. And the packaging industry has to reduce by 25% how much plastic it's using by 2032. So we're starting to see a push to, yeah, we want you to pay for some of this expensive stuff, but we also want you to start turning off the faucet at some right. level. And we can argue whether 25% is the right number, should it have been 40, should it have been 10, but the point is it's a number, they have to start reducing. And they also built in a lot of protections for how that money gets spent mm -hmm. um, so that it's not just up to the industry to decide how to spend that $5 billion. Um, and um, they actually set aside percentages that have to be spent to address problems that are created by plastics in frontline communities, in poor communities, which is where we see plastics often being produced. We see the toxic chemicals that are, people are being exposed to from that production. It's where plastics are often disposed of. So we see the impacts of that in those communities. And also just to sort of level the playing field for these communities that don't have the resources um, to deal with this problem that's being foisted upon them. So and so the idea is to increase sort of the, the amount of demands that we're putting on the industry um, as we start to put the responsibility back on and Just them. to back up on EPR, those sorts of arrangements already exist for bulky items like mattresses and exactly. things like batteries. So I think most people are familiar with the notion of um, having a way of returning those things or recycling those things when right. they're used in a safe way. Andy, I would love it again if you take us onto the global stage. So we have these two states here, which are, or three states we were talking about, which are doing such interesting things. The EU, I know, has had EPR for packaging for a number of years. The UN has had plastic source reduction attempts. Tell me what you see as promising models around the world for, for reducing plastics at source. There has been amazing progress on this in the last two or three years. Not enough, we have a long way to go, but there are national now na examples of national policies in important countries that are forcing source reduction on this industry. What are those examples? You mentioned one, the European Union issued a plastics directive a few years ago that is binding obligations on all the member states to pass national laws that will reduce single-use plastic. They're not as strong as we would like, they need to be better, but they are, do they are, they are moving it in the right direction and that's underway. It's not a to be done, it will happen. Uh, California, we just talked about. Chile passed few, two years ago uh, what we consider to be the gold standard of, of single-use plastic reduction national legislation in the world. Um, it has a lot of interesting components in it, including forcing retailers to get back to using refillable beverage bottles um, and, and, and making that possible for people to, the consumer to have a choice between the refillable bottle and the plastic bottle. We see, um, we see in, in some corporate progress on this, um, which is surprising. So, we focus mostly on winning national policy outcomes that will change the, change the handling of, of single-use plastics. 
part of the way, but there are some big corporate actors, bad actors here that we are pressing together with allies. One, one or two you may have heard of. There's this company called Coca-Cola, and there's this company called Amazon, um, both of which use very large amounts of single-use plastic as a standard part of their business. Coca-Cola is the largest global producer of single-use plastic beverage bottles. 22% of the industry is globally is Coke. This is a number of plastic beverage bottles in the hundreds and hundreds of millions, you know, all the time. Uh, and I've forgotten the exact number, I should have it. I'm happy to say, as Jackie just mentioned, that Coca-Cola's global president made a commitment to get to 25% of its global product through refillable, refillable packages, not recyclable but refillable packages by the year 2030, up from 16% right now. We think that's a billion single-use plastic bottles not going into the ocean every year when, when that's done. That's a public commitment by a global CEO of a big brand. Now, that matters on its own, but it matters especially because it signals to the policymakers that this is a safe space for them to go. So if you're a congressman in the United States of America or you're a state legislator in California or New York or Texas, and you're being wondering, can I do this, or do I end up looking like some kind of crazy, idealistic, greeny, and I don't want to be that person because I'm a politician and I need to be, look more like a centrist all the time. Um, guess what? If Coca-Cola's made an announcement, you suddenly get comfortable. It suddenly seems practical. Now, Amazon is yet to make an announcement. Amazon uses, introduces single-use plastic packaging into a global system that you're very familiar with. Um, and, and they are in a position, unlike most companies, to really lead a change. Because why? They're led by an engineer. They have endless resources. They control their systems top to bottom. They're vertically integrated. They have huge market power. And you know, they, they actually, you know, are located in Seattle, which is kind of green. <laughs> <laughs> we have a campaign to get Amazon, with many allies, to get Amazon to reduce their single-use plastics, which we think would not only signal to the policymakers, but have a transformative effect on the, on the systems in the world, the, the retailing systems in the world. In April, the shareholders of Amazon met and voted on a series of shareholder resolutions and more people voted in to, against management's advice that Amazon should take steps to publish its plastic footprint and make a plan to reduce it than has ever been voted in the history of any company resolution ever considered by Amazon. Yeah. And we share this accomplishment with lots of other groups. 48% of the shares voted on April, in April, just a few months ago, voted against management for this outcome. 48% of the shares voted. So Amazon has yet to publicly respond to that, um, that event. If we if took Jeff Bezos' shares out of the vote, we would have won straight up. Um, just take one man's shares out of the tally, we would have had a majority of the shares. So I think Amazon has an opportunity to be a big leader here. They have made a quiet progress in their second largest market is Germany. And they have quietly taken Amazon plastic out of the, their, their fulfillment centers in Germany. Very quietly done so. We don't understand why they haven't promoted it more. Maybe because they don't want to be held into the same standard here right away. But there is, there is, um, there is keep your eye on this. And, 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 and you know, that, that'll, that'll matter a lot. So there are success stories. Chile, California, there are some big state advances. New York, Washington here. Um, a month ago, Canada, Trudeau administration, took steps on a national basis to force single-use categories of single-use foodware out of that country's system. That's, that's a done deal. Um, India, which we had no part of, the Indian government has been very concerned about single-use plastic for a long time. They're not so good at implementation in India as we would like them to be, but they are saying they're going to do really good things. So there's progress. Have I forgotten so, any important ones? I hope no, I have. No. <laughs> okay. You can always come back. Yeah. Um, but Jackie, do we have any data about the pandemic? Because we all, 
uh, there was a trend happening anyway of home delivery and, and individual packaging coming to your home. Do we know what impact that has had on the production yet of packaging, or do we have any sense? I haven't anecdotal? seen any actual numbers on that, but yeah. anecdotally, I think it's it's pretty clear um, that we've all been having a lot more things shipped, um, especially when we didn't want to go in grocery stores and we didn't want to go to shopping at pharmacies right. and things like that. Um, there's also uh, a lot of people ask me, well, what about you know masks? You know, right. they're plastic, they're they're waste. And you know, I think it's really important that we make clear that we've started focusing on single-use, unnecessary single-use plastics. We do not include medical uses in that category. Um, you know, and I think the industry likes to try to paint environmentalists as, oh, they just want to stop using all plastics, even medical, medically important plastics, because that's a great way to marginalize conservationists. And that's not what I hear conservationists saying. What I hear us saying is, let's start with the most unnecessary chunk, which is really big, and let's see if we can put a dent in that and go forward. So, and that's going to include this additional shipping plastic that um, that we know we've, we've been seeing lately. So, can go I ahead. just I just Absolutely. want to make Citizen Action vivid here. So we talked about <laughs> California, right? As as oh, yeah. fifth largest, you know, everybody here knows this. If California were a country, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. So when California does things, it matters. Right. How did this happen? Lots of lots of advocates, lots of NGO groups. I can't name them all. I want to call it a couple. The Nature Conservancy of California uh, led a um, effort to make sure this thing would be on the ballot. So 900,000 signatures were obtained by, among citizens of California to put this question on the ballot in the fall. That changed the conversation that we and other NGOs had been having with the industry in Sacramento, mm -hmm. where multiple legislative efforts had been made and then at the very last minute, key senators would go missing over and over again. We had this, Jackie and I lived through this very painfully, where we had counted the votes, we knew we could win, and then you just wouldn't get the, the quorum on the ke day of the key vote. This is, of course, what you do if you're a politician that wants to you know, not have to take a position, uh, but has the industry come to you privately and say, if I need you, will you go missing? And you say, yeah, if I need you, you know, if you need me, I'll go missing. So that, that is a way that the public interest gets subverted. It had happened to us in California too many times because I want to recount. Then the ballot was qualified. That changed the conversation. And so there was now a nego negotiation with the industry over the terms of legislation SB 54 mm -hmm. that, that got done on very satisfactory terms. And, and that's an example of how democracy can be made to work, as, you know, as, as ugly and, and difficult as it sometimes is it got done in a successful way. Well, just to add one thing quickly yeah. to that, which is what's interesting is clearly the industry in California didn't want plastics legislation and they were doing what Andy described. But when polled, the citizens of California, 80%, 85% want to see plastic reduced. And so what the industry saw coming was a ballot initiative fight, which was going to show them for what they are, which is the source of the problem and that they were going to lose and that's what really, I think, brought them to the table. And, and I think what's interesting is we were able to walk away from the industry-controlled legislature, go to the citizens, and they were like, yes, we want this. And then that forced the industry. And I think that's something we might want to revisit in other places. So yesterday, for anybody who was here, we began to hear about some of the problems with, it was actually wonderful to talk about right whales and entanglement, sometimes with plastic ropes. So we were getting a big picture of how plastics are having an impact in the sea. But I'd like you both, again, you as a toxicologist and you with this great understanding of the, the depths, to give us a closer understanding of the impact of plastics, both microplastics and the larger ones, on sea life and then on our human bodies, because it always helps to understand, unfortunately, how things affect us as we decide. It's a big question. Um, not sure where to start, except to say, if you imagine plastics are in the oceans, um, and there's microplastics and there's big chunks of plastics. You can imagine then the kinds of impacts they're going to have on marine animals. They're going to either, they're going to consume them because a lot of marine mammals are filter, marine animals are filter feeders. They're, mm. they're going to get them think, as if they were food particles. They're getting into their systems. 
um, they, that can cause the, a nutritional problem, it can cause them to, to feel full and stop feeding and it never goes away and they never feed and they starve to death. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. There's entanglement with plastics, which is what we've seen so many vivid pictures of, animals being essentially choked by plastic six-pack rings or plastic ropes or the, um, the, the right whales being entangled in, in ropes. Um, and so it's like it's coming at them from all sides. And we did a study of this. We identified 1,800 uh, marine mammals and sea turtles um, that had been um, either killed or severely injured by plastics. And I'm talking about whales, dolphins, manatees, sea turtles. 80% of the animals that we identified in this study were endangered species. So there aren't even that many of them. So for instance, there's 350 roughly right whales, North Atlantic right whales, right. sadly. That's about all that's left. Um, these are species, there aren't that many of them, and we're finding 1,800 of them that are being entangled. And that can lead to um, you know, inability to feed, inability to get away from predators, inability to dive, which is to get to the food, um, you know, bleeding, infections, you, know, you name it. And, um, and so that's, that gives you an idea of the problem. I can tell you that every autopsy done on a sea turtle, they find plastics in their bellies. Whether it's an adult sea turtle that's been around for a long time, or it's a juvenile sea turtle, they still find plastics in the bellies. Um, plastic bags look a lot like jellyfish, which is sea turtles' favorite food. So they see a plastic bag, they go for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they get a lot of plastic bags in their bellies that can cause them to have buoyancy problems. They can't regulate their buoyancy, which they need to do. It can cause starvation, as I said. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of these, these are, are attractive to right. marine animals, and that's, that's where the problem starts. Do you want me to say something about the toxicity also? Or? Yeah, I'd love to okay. hear about I'm watching your, your expertise. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, plastics are petroleum-based. They're made from petroleum. Um, so they're basically made from a, a soup of toxic chemicals, and they contain lots of things that are really bad for us, um, things that cause uh, cancer. They're chemicals that cause uh, reproductive issues. We've, we've heard about um, the, the um, estrogen mimics. They, they mimic estrogen. They can affect sperm count. They can affect all kinds of um, sexual development in people. Um, and so these are chemicals that are available to the animals that swallow the plastics. Mm. Um, they're available to us if we're eating things that are wrapped in plastics or even drinking water that has plastics in it. The exact pinpointing of saying, well, somebody got this disease or has this problem because they drank a bottle of water, you're never going to get that. But what we do know is it's better not to have exposure to these chemicals if we can help it. And the way to do that, again, is to find solutions to plastics and to move away from plastics and packaging. Andy, these are scary thoughts we're hearing about, and yet we keep using plastics. Help us understand the messaging challenges that you deal with, again, domestically and globally, when you're trying to convince people that these are issues that we need to deal with today and not push off for the future. Yeah, um, there's a difficult balance in, in organizing people t to step up the big challenges between delivering the bad news mm. <laughs> straightforwardly and, and, and then illustrating enough success that people believe there's a pathway to a better outcome. You have to scare people but not discourage them, you know? <laughs> and. I mean, if they deserve to be scared, as they should be, about plastic. This has been an issue, if it weren't for the industry, that is, that as Jackie has emphasized, is aggressively presenting an alternative set of messages. This is an issue that people pretty quickly understand. I mean, you, whether it's you talk to them about bathtubs <laughs> or you talk to them about this is a material that lasts forever and they're designing it to be used once, does that make any sense? I mean, you can get through pretty quickly to there's a deep problem here. Plus, we're all lucky enough that we can remember a world where plastic was not everywhere. Um, it's a back to the future kind of thing that we can talk about, right? So it doesn't seem technically impossible. So this has been 
a relatively good messaging success, as the California victory demonstrates. You don't win in California. I mean, the, 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 you know, the battle in California required both sides to be analyzing who had the better message, and, and obviously the industry decided we could win, you know, or, or had a chance at winning, our side. So the biggest problem we have is the count, as we started out talking, is the counter-narrative uh, that's just like, you guys need to recycle better. Please recycle better. How come you're not recycling better? That kind of message, which the industry supports strongly, uh, is the real problem that we have. I'm going to ask you something. I was recently doing a story in, a couple of months ago in Philadelphia when they reversed their mask mandate. And I was in um, Rittenhouse Square and I walked across to somebody and um, started asking him. And Philadelphia had seen an increase in crime. And this guy looked at me and said, you know, uh, people only want to talk about plastic bags and masks. I mean, it was just, you know, it was so peripheral to what he saw as the urgent problems. So how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, there are urgent problems, so I mean, you have to right. validate both. I mean, yeah. and, um, and I mean, I, I, I think that um, I don't ever want to take away from the fact that there are wonderful people fighting for other causes mm -hmm. other than plastic pollution. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you just, we live in a complicated world and we each pick the thing that we're going to make a difference on and try to focus on getting that done. I mean, I don't think that's what I, that's yeah, my issues answer. Of let's talk about issues of equity and how we manage these things around the world. But Jackie, you want yeah, to Yeah, one point? thing I wanted to, to add to that is, you know, talk about urgent problems. One thing we haven't talked about this morning is climate change. Right. And, you know, climate change, if, when you ask what's the, the worst, you know, environmental disaster on the planet, I think climate change. It's, it's really, it's an it, intransigent problem. And plastic is a big contributor to climate change. So, I mean, to answer your question, I think part of it is making connections between the plastics problem and some of these other urgent problems that we're dealing with, and climate change being one of them. If plastics were a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter of global greenhouse gases. So, and that's because, guess what? It's made from petroleum. You emit greenhouse gases when you make it. You emit greenhouse gases, you know, through use and distribution. You emit greenhouse gases in end of life. And when you add that all up, it's a big contribution. It's another way we're using fossil fuels that's contributing to this crisis that we know exists. And I think that's another thing to keep in mind when we think about why we need to attack this problem. Because when we, when we stop making so many plastics, that'll, that'll be a contribution to the, the climate problem. Can, can I make another point yeah. about messaging? Yeah. One of the reasons that the industry wins on plastic is that they make people think that plastic is just like aluminum or plastic is just like glass, which actually are infinitely recyclable. I mean, if you, if you recapture the aluminum and you recapture the, ga the glass, it can, be ba it can be made into products that are equally useful. Aluminum, aluminum in and out of cans could be in and out of cans forever. And so people extrapolate, and the industry is happy to have you extrapolate. The plastic industry is ha happy to have you extrapolate incorrectly that plastic is just like aluminum, just like glass. It's not. If you, tr if you, when, if you were successful in recapturing glass, uh, plastic, which, as we know, the world is not very good at, and then you try to reprocess it back into another plastic product, the material degrades, as this very informed gentleman over here said at the beginning. It degrades, unlike aluminum. It degrades in the process, so it doesn't really serve very often to be a bottle again. So what was once a bottle will become a floor mat and, or something else that is a lower use of the material. So it, it's not a perfectly circular system. And, and they mislead us. They mislead us on that by saying, isn't recycling good for aluminum? Yes, of course it is. We all support that. Good thing. So why isn't it equally good? And, and there's, a, there's a messaging issue there that they're winning. So I have a question. I was recently moderating a climate panel, and um, somebody spoke up and said, so where's the media on this? And I noticed that same question actually on this Twitter feed I was looking at. I, could even, I even wrote it down, but it was, it was, it was something like, what, you know, what if the media would step up, step up and actually communicate um, how bad plastics are? You're the, advocacy, your fault, you're the <laughs> advocacy organization. We cover things and we think about accountability. But what do you, are you critical of media coverage on these issues? Is, it, is there something that's missing in, 
in what you think people are reading about? Well, Again, you're the advocacy it's people, kind, you're not. It's kind of you to invite this, this criticism at this yeah. moment, but the, I, I, no, I'm not. I mean, we, we all have an unlimited appetite for media coverage for, for our cause, right. and so we're always going to say as advocates that they're not giving us enough attention, and if more attention would help, yes. But actually, on this issue, the media has done a pretty good job. And especially, it's always compared to what? I mean, if, you, if we work on other things. We work, as you mentioned, we work on fishery management. Fishery management is not so easy to get the media interested in. Uh, setting scientific quotas, not so easy to get the media interested in. Making sure bycatch measures are taking. Bycatch, you know, you know, hard to get the media to come along with you. On this one, they come. I'm, I'm going to read this quote. Imagine if the press actually spearheaded efforts to actually make people aware of the effect of plastic on the environment. And there was a whole long, you know, a lot of people commenting on that. I had well, a story I mean, idea. Go. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> I mean, here's a story idea. One of the things that I, I think I agree with Andy, I think it's been a media um, intense issue to work on. Um, I always get this question that I really don't like, and they won't let me not answer it, which is, what can people do? What can people do? Well, I'm going to ask you, what can I people do? You I knew you were going to everybody out here, and it was so a question I had. I think, it, and we're going to let people ask in two minutes, but so you don't want me go to ahead. answer it? Go ahead now. And well, I think people they, do? they're <laughs> expecting me to say something like, they need to recycle, they need to purchase, you know, use their purchasing power, and you know, you've already heard from us that that's really not our, our spin. Um, I think what they should be, the story they should be telling is the story of this like, this starting kindling of wildfire of l local policies and state level policies and national policies and asking people, what has your city passed a policy on plastics? Has your state passed a policy on plastics? What can people do? Be plastics advocates, try to push for these policies because we've seen that work in other campaigns that we've run where things start to they start to notice their next door neighbor town has passed a policy, but they haven't. And pretty soon we can start sending that message really clearly to the policymakers at the top when they start seeing this happening in the grassroots. I'm and gonna ask one last question. Oh, one you go right ahead. So <laughs> it, there, there is a theory of social change which emphasizes right. messaging, period, right? Which is just get the messaging right, get the media behind you and the right. world will change. Those of us who've done real policy making understand that that messaging is one of about four or five things you have to get right. You have to do some grassroots organizing, you have to get the science out there in front of the policy makers, you have to have the law understood, you probably have to have some direct uh, people we would call lobbyists who can have direct <laughs> contact and credibility with the policy makers. We at Oceana think those are the five techniques of winning policy change. Communications is one of those five, an important one but not exclusively it. There are occasionally really sad, and, and part of the reason people need to overemphasize messaging is because it's easier for everybody to understand, right, right. than it is to understand, have everybody understand the science, for example. So it's more accessible, it's more fun. There are, there are, um, there is in this issue, the David Attenborough Nature BBC Productions on ocean plastic changed the conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely right. And, and I mean, that is a really successful example of a messenger right. who we all trusted, Attenborough, who was extremely gifted at presenting an issue and then wonderful photography, underwater photography, that's in the most expensive kind of TV production to do or film production to do. I used to work at Discovery, so I know something about that. And they got it right. And they changed the world with those images. And, you know, the Queen of, the Queen of England saw the TV show and, you know, things happened. And, and you can actually connect the <laughs> dots helps between have the queen on your side, you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the message by itself was so well crafted right. and so powerful and so wonderfully delivered through a credible messenger. But that is so that is a success story on plastic. But that is an exception to the general rule of how you change the policy. I have been dominating the conversation and asking the questions, and I would love it if anybody in the audience here has questions. We have mics that are going to circulating with Wes and Sean over there, and I can see lots of hands up. So far away. Thank you so much for this terrifying <laughs> presentation. Uh, I sense a common thread with a couple of other issues that I've been paying attention to. Uh, one is the, the messaging from above that you're talking about has also been applied to carbon imprint and how that's being pushed down on the individual rather than those responsible. And also, um, 
specifically health issues like sugar, diabetes, uh, things that are plaguing populations. And it all comes down to me to intent. Can intent be shown by those uh, pushing the negative and nefarious aspects of, of these issues? And if so, can there ever be any legal action taken? You want to handle it? that? Mm, he's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard, no, it's, not, it's hard to show intent to the legal standard that you would require to get liability for, you know, intentional malfeasance. It's very difficult to show that, partly because the people doing this, you know, are sophisticated international corporate leaders with good lawyers, right? So they, they don't, they don't, they don't easily step into that mistake. Um, the second point is that the primary intent of the, of the corporation is usually to provide a product that people want, right? So the, the, the secondary effect is the pollution effect that we're worried about. So they always are able to kind of implicate you as the purchaser <laughs> in the mistake. Um, so peop people do you know, it's not like um, a straightforward malefactor who does nothing good for society, right? That was just, so the, the good and the bad are combined. And so I think it, it, but I do think that they are affirmatively negligent, if that's, if that's a concept, you know what I mean? That they are, they know, they are negligent about the side effects. Um, and they are, and they are willingly ignoring those predictable side effects. And so you ought to be able to kind of catch them on a concept of, if you were trying to be lawyerly, negligence. But it doesn't really work as, you know, as in most legal circumstances. There are people, however, trying to do this. So your question is not, it, it indicates an opportunity that people are looking at. There are law, lawyers that we know that are looking at this in the United States of America that are trying to figure it out and as they ultimately were able to do with the tobacco industry, to get the plastic industry brought to account in the way that you are suggesting. So it's not such a crazy idea that there aren't smart people trying to do it. They are. We're not trying to do it at Oceana, but there are people trying to do it that I respect and admire. So, and schools and I think, health, you know, they might, they might succeed, but it's an uphill fight. But like lead paint, right? I mean, same idea with lead paint as you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. schools of public health picking yeah. it up, right. Another question. Um, the mics a, are moving around. We have a question from our virtual audience here. Okay. Um, could you tell us about some viable alternatives that you see being used um, for, uh, for packaging solutions? Sure. Um, I mean, one of the things we've seen a lot of in some of the states and cities where we've gotten policies is um, bans on, um, well, what they essentially say is they call them um, by request that by request rules. So for instance, if you go to get takeout, you have to request utensils or you have to request, um, and that's, that's one of the things that cuts down on the plastics you're getting. But we're also starting to see things like utensils that are made out of fibers, um, that are not plastics, um, you know, things bamboo. like that, bamboo um, coming through. Um, that kind of thing is a shift away from plastics. That's a good thing. Um, I've seen new startup companies starting to form, which is huge because it's like these could be the next big companies. These could be companies that end up, you know, making bank, you know. Um, and so, for instance, there's one called Recup, where it's essentially a system where they work with retailers so that when you go to buy a cup of coffee, you get a reusable cup. And you maybe pay a dollar more for the coffee. When you're done, you give them back the cup. You could actually drink it there, like in the old days or like they do in Europe. Um, and then return the cup, um, get your dollar back, or you can take it home and bring it back the next time, or you, you, know, or you can throw it out. I mean, most people won't if they're going to get a dollar back. Um, they have systems where they standardize those types of things, the cups or the, the beverage containers, so that they can be in machines and they can actually be delivered to the person and the person can put them back into the machine that goes through some back channels of getting cleaned and sterilized and gets used again, which sounds maybe a little weird, like you might use a cup that someone else used, but we do that in diners all the time. It's not really that crazy, right? Um, and so the idea is essentially to go back to using things that are reusable and systems being put in place that can be managed by companies that can make a business out of it, can be managed through your iPhones, you know, there are apps, like I need to return my cup, did I get my credits, you know, 
how many cups do I owe? You know, there are different ways to do this in the sort of 21st century um, that we need to start stimulating and, and get helping these companies get started so that we can still get a cup of coffee and leave with it if we want, but we don't have to throw away the cup. But a quick follow on that, Andy. We, we mentioned equity earlier on. Plastic's cheap, and we know there are lovely wooden toy stores here, and, and they're a lot more expensive than plastic toys. That's one small example. But are there equity issues domestically and internationally? Yeah, this? so this is one of the industry's stronger arguments, right? So the plastic industry will say that those of us who are trying to restrict <coughs> single-use plastics are elitist because we're going to mm -hmm. force higher costs in, onto people who don't necessarily have the resources to deal with them. So there you go, you environmentalists again, acting like you elitist rich people that you, you know the rest of the world should not trust. So that's the thing they will say. And it is true that pla virgin plastic is very inexpensive. Um, and part of the problem with the recycling narrative, by the way, is that virgin plastic is usually <laughs> cheaper than recycled plastic. So the market incentives don't support the recycling theory. Um, but we, but we, so we respond, A, that there was a world, as Jackie said, there was a world not so long ago where textile, glass, aluminum, cardboard, paper were the packaging single-use materials that we lived with. We didn't have, I mean, you didn't, in my childhood, you didn't walk down the grocery store aisle and be surrounded by plastic. You I can remember it. It's not like a theoretical thing. So these are familiar materials. They can be used. They were used in our memory. So, and none of us you know, the world had equitable priced products then. So it's not inherent that you have to have single-use plastics to sell everyday products at a reasonable price. We can remember a day when that was not true. That's my first answer. Second answer is that the hidden costs of the pollution mm -hmm. are inequitable. Right. The health impacts of the pollution, the microplastic impacts, the production impacts it. Go, go see where the petrochemical facilities are located they're not going to be in rich neighborhoods. They're going to be in poor neighborhoods. And those people in those neighborhoods are unfairly suffering the contamination and health impacts of those production activities, and on and on and on. So the, um, that's my answer. Let's have another question. The mics are out there, so I... Over this way. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I very much rep uh, respect the work that Oceana is doing. Um, this is a giant topic to try and squeeze into an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and we haven't actually talked about too much about plastic in the oceans. We've talked about plastic in general. Right. Um, and I guess, and I was having trouble trying to figure out like what kind of question I'm going to ask and bringing up the, um, bringing up the inequities in, as far as plastic goes is something that uh, I feel like I can touch on. So my father-in-law and I have done work in Nicaragua and Coca-Cola and Unilever are dumping plastics in that area by the tons and tons. They have no infrastructure to handle it, so they're burning it in their front yards, or like in Asia, they're dumping it into rivers and it's going into the ocean. Um, while that argument for inequities works for that, I've heard Oceana use that argument that we can't, as a privileged society, decide that we're not going to eat seafood or we're going to reduce our seafood consumption as a way to reduce plastics. I know that it's your position that, um, that derelict gear is not the majority of plastics in the ocean, but there are some people that say that it still is. I've done work in the islands and the ocean um, cleanups in Hawaii and stuff that say that, um, or that I've seen like tons and tons and tons or overwhelming amounts of derelict gear and very, very little domestic plastic. And so what I'd like to know is can we, can Oceana kind of bring up some kind of messaging that says it, in our privileged societies where we have a choice to be able to say I'm not going to eat fish and support this massive industry that continues to pollute without, without concern for our oceans, can Oceana say yes, in, in a privileged environment we can say that is a great step that you can do as a consumer. The, uh, the, 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 just so I understand the final question, would Oceana say to people, if you're a privileged person, you should not eat fish? Yeah. Okay. Have the opportunity to not eat fish. Yeah. So um, this, this question of whether 
you know, the best thing we could do for the ocean is to discourage people from eating fish is a fair question. And there are people of good intent who are vegans and them probably many Sylvia of them work L. at Oceana and uh, Sylvia L is not a fish eater. Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's a you know, a moral commitment that we all honor and respect and is a good thing on a bunch of dimensions for the world. So if you are tempted to become a vegan or reduce your fish consumption, it's, it's almost certainly a good thing that you can do for the planet. We are emphatically, though, as the gentleman pointed out, though, alert to the fact that there are many people in the world for whom fish is a necessary nutrition. It's necessary. It's essential to feeding their children, to feeding themselves. And so the idea that you can broaden that message out, that the way we're going to save the oceans is by all stopping to eating fish, is a deeply elitist message that is not acceptable, not practical, not good. And so we have been resistant to that argument and have been saying that one of the great opportunities the planet has on an equity issue is to rebuild an, ocean, an abundant ocean so that there are lots of, there's lots of healthy seafood and the price is affordable to people all over the world. We have a team in the Philippines. Philippines is not a wealthy country. Philippines has lots of people who need fish for their children's brain development, not just because they want it, you know, they, they, you know, for permanent benefits of their children. And so the reason that we were able to recruit a wonderful team there who are very effective is because of this idea, save the oceans, feed the world, idea that Oceana has stood behind. So there, I, I, that's, that's our view of that question. I think we've probably got time for one last question. Is that right? Wes has got a question up there. Um, I'm following on the same question of elitism. All of this, I mean, this is all fantastic information and really making evident the problems and some of the solutions. But in between, there is a huge range of individuals whose livelihood depends on every step of a toxic process. And how can these efforts to make long-term global change in the use of plastics and the distribution of plastics and the cleanup of plastics, something that, that doesn't then fur further harm those who are most at risk. Jackie. Yeah, I, it's a really good question. It comes up around a lot of the environmental issues that we tackle. Um, and I think it's really important that we, as we're discussing these issues, um, we recognize that many times what we're talking about is stopping the expansion of an industry, like offshore drilling. We've stopped the expansion in the United States, thank you, to the United States government <laughs> um, for hearing that. But also um, on plastics, where we know this is an industry that's going to explode, there's going to be more factories and more plants. And really, that's where I think a lot of the, um, the change is going to start. And, and therefore, it's not as much of an issue for people that are already employed in those places, for instance. But for those that are, you know, we need to also be in the conversation about just transition and figuring out where, um, how those people can be supported. Um, are there new opportunities that arise as a result of the shift um, where they can be plugged in? Are there educational needs? These are definitely things that we need to be thinking about when we start making real progress. Like if we were, if we were looking at actual passage of a federal source reduction law, for instance, that I think that would be a good time to be looking at some of those things. And I think in California, there was a lot of awareness about equity um, in the discussions around the, um, the California law mm -hmm. that led to lots of provisions to address um, low-income communities, frontline communities, um, in not only the financial piece of the, of the source reduction law, but also in some of the other more substantive parts of it. So, I think it's an excellent point. Thank you for raising the, it. The, I want to start. Plastic industry is growing exponentially. Jackie said this in the beginning. It's growing exponentially. So if you don't like how much single-use plastic there is right now, get ready. You know, get ready. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to triple in, in the next 30 years. It may quadruple in the next 30 years. So if you are making the jobs argument against regulating this industry, um, our answer, one answer would be, Nobody's going to lose a job that they currently have anytime soon. We're just trying, you know, we're just trying to. No, I understand. I mean, I, I don't mean that you personally, but if one is making the argument that we need this terrible industry because it employs people, which is a familiar argument that people make in service of polluters of all kinds, we need this terrible industry which is destroying the planet because it employs people, and we care about people having jobs. Well, this is a situation where, you know, we this industry is growing so rapidly that the people who are currently employed in the plastic industry have pretty secure jobs. 
if we can just control the rate of growth by bringing it down to even just flat, you know, the flat, the flat level of plastic production, we would have done an enormous good thing for the future instead of having it being exponentially grow. So I don't think anybody, you know, I wish we were, I wish we were in a stronger position on the industry, but this is not a, this is not a, this is not a conversation where the job, the current jobs argument is really very realistic. Gosh, I promised I'd stop this conversation at 10.45. One more question. Can we take one more, Wesson? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sean, one more. Checking the mic. Oh, there we go. Okay, and then I'm afraid we have to stop, but do yeah. you have a few minutes afterwards? You can maybe sure. hang around a little bit, because I... We need to go so, ahead. Uh, it seems to me a basic takeaway today is, is this is a supply chain issue. Okay, uh, they've made that point elegantly. So where is the best choke point? If we start from hydrocarbons and we go through all these steps, where should we try to shut it off? Oh, Whoa. oh boy. Um, <laughs> Big well, question to answer. So, so Jack and I will both comment. So Oceana has a long record of fighting offshore oil and gas production because of its threats to ocean conservation, direct threats, like in the Gulf of Mexico, Deepwater Horizon right. disaster, and also its indirect effect through climate change and also its effects on coastal tourism and fishery businesses, right? Because when you have, uh, have these, these oil spills, all those bad things happen. We care about all those things. It is true that that, that industry is the, is the source product for plastic. So if you, can, if you can raise the price by restricting the global development of offshore oil and gas, you can make it harder to produce plastic. Right now the price of plastic is so low, though, that there's a very long way to go. And so, um, we, we think that the real choke point ends up being where we've been talking about today, which is legislation that restricts and prohibits the use of single-use plastic. That's, that's where we think the choke point is. It's a great strategic question, though, because you some, often by going further upstream, you get more leverage. In this case, we, the, the exchanging the battle that we're fighting for fighting directly against the global offshore oil and gas industry and winning quick, quick victories there is probably not an easy exchange. It's not, you know what I mean? The packaging, issue is the packaging industry is where the choke point is. That said, we are fighting against offshore oil and gas, but you know, it's, it's a harder, longer fight. Jackie, do you want to add Well, I'll just there? add, um, there are other organizations that are taking different angles on it. Um, some people are fighting fracking. Um, fracking is where a lot of the raw materials for plastics comes from and why plastics are so cheap is because fracked gas is so cheap. Um, we, we're not in that fight, but others are. And another um, place that some others are focused is on the establishment of new petrochemical facilities around the United States, especially in places like Texas and the Gulf area and the Ohio River Valley where they're getting the fracked gas and then they want to pop up these new plants to make plastics. Um, so that's another choke point that other organizations are focusing on, which I think is a good thing that we have a lot of different angles going in here. Can I make one other equity point? One other equity point, and then we really do need to stop. <laughs> so equity point, everybody here cares about equity. It's really important. In the country of Brazil, this is the, this is the message I should stop talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're being cut off. All right. In the country of Brazil, uh, the, the company called iFood, which is the Uber Eats of of Brazil has made a big commitment to reducing its packaging, big public commitment, in response to some oceanic campaigning. That, that battle was won in alliance with the waste pickers of Brazil. Hmm. There are a million very poor people in Brazil, a million of them, whose job is to waste pick. Not something you would like your grandchildren to be doing for the rest of their lives. They were our allies in this battle. Hold it for you. It's supposed to go to your cheek. All right, I'm going to stop <laughs> talking. And, and any one of you wants to follow up and help me understand, you know, explain why that is. I mean, that was a very reassuring to right. us right. that we had an issue that was, you know, where the equity impacts were correct. It's just a wonderful conversation when we can't stop the questions coming. <laughs> Andy Sharpless, Jackie Savage, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everybody out there for your great questions and thank you for people online who sent in questions too. I know we've got further programming this afternoon. And Darren, did you want to add Five something? Five o'clock tonight. Five o'clock tonight. tonight. Be back in this room for more great 
uh, future of our oceans. And thank you both again very much. It thank was you. great fun and very informative.